Can raise your hand. Okay, good. Welcome. Any first, there's a few more first year graduate students. Raise your hand if you're a first year graduate student. Raise it up high. Yeah. Okay, very good. Good to have you here. Um, any newly arrived postdocs? Do we have any newly arrived postdocs or research scientists visiting? Yes, welcome. It's good to have you here. So any of those people that uh, have raised their hand, if you haven't met them, uh, please take, take some time afterwards and introduce yourself. Uh, most of our colloquia are going to be in person. This was originally scheduled in person, but as happens and has will happen from time to time, uh, we, we do have the luxury if for some reason we have a, a speaker that's unable to travel at the last minute, and we are able to do the connection online. This room is reasonably well set up both for you to hear the audio, but also to be able to do audience question and answer afterwards. So we do like to, to reserve some time at the end uh, for you to be able to ask questions. So please be thinking of those as you go along. And now uh, Professor Agarwal, who organizes our colloquium series is gonna introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Uh, so, well, welcome to the first colloquium of this uh, all, all semester. And our speaker today is uh, Professor Harka Majumdar from University of Washington, Seattle, not in DC, Seattle. Uh, so I'm going to introduce him, uh, say a few things about him. He did his master's and PhD at the Stanford University and uh, then did a postdoc uh, for at uh, UC Berkeley and also Intel Corporation. And after that, of course, he became a professor at University of Washington. And uh, he has been quite successful there in working in the area of nanophotonics and what he calls beta optics. He has collected all kinds of uh, young investigators award, several awards over the time. So I think, um, as you see, on the back of me, the title is even there. Full color imaging using large aperture beta optics. So this would be an interesting topic, I think, for this group. So with that, let me invite Professor Majmu Das to present uh, his uh, colloquium. Arka, are you ready yes. to go? Okay. Yes. Yeah, you can hear me and uh, hopefully you can sc uh, see my screen and thank you, Dr. Agarwal. And yeah, I, I was supposed to be here, but I had some yes. some health <laughs> issues, so I had to do this thing online. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to tell you some of the work that we're doing on this full color imaging using large aperture metoptics. So the work will really focus on just this particular aspect that can we uh, capture good quality imaging using uh, this, this meta optics that many people also call it meta surface. Um, uh, I'm from University of Washington. Most of the work that I'm going to present, you can find the papers from my group website. And if you have any question, you can always send me an email uh, at this email ID. Uh, like uh, very briefly, would like to acknowledge my team, collaborators, and different funding agency who has supported uh, some of the work that I'm going to present today. Um, so before going into uh, the details about uh, meta optics, let me tell you very briefly about what are the things we are doing in my lab in general. Um, so what we are interested in understanding what is known as the uh, light matter interaction. So how, how electron and photon interact uh, at very, very small length scales. So if you confine light in a very small volume for a large amount of time and you have some material there, what kind of interaction you can get is really what we are interested in. And to do that, we design and fabricate. Uh, let me just make sure that we can get the pointer. Uh, Hopefully. We, can, we can see the mouse. Okay, sounds good. So yeah, so we design and fabricate various nanophotonic structures, um, including uh, photonic crystal, ring resonator, and meta optics. And on top of that, we put new materials. So these nanophotonic structures are generally made with silicon, silicon nitride, or gallium phosphide. And the materials that we generally put in is a 2D material. That's we have a lot of big push on it. Uh, some non-volatile phase change material also solution process material. We are actually part of a science and technology center uh, hosted at University of Washington, looking into the quantum property of the solution process material. And with this hybrid system in my group, we are primarily focusing on four different applications. In one of them, we are looking into quantum many body simulation with interacting photons. 
that actually has been really my uh, own like PhD background and my PhD was in quantum optics. And I'm really interested in exploring that whether it's possible to get photon-photon uh, -photon interaction at a single photon level uh, with of course application for example, quantum uh, simulation or maybe even quantum computing. In another approach, we are working very closely with Intel of putting uh, this non-volatile phase change material on silicon photonics to create like a programmable photonic platform. One of the idea that we are fairly excited that there is Intel, many of you probably know that in their silicon photonics, they have lasers on chip and they also have the modulators and these lasers and modulators are hard coded. So if one of them break, the whole chip basically becomes non-functional. Uh, so can we create a non-volatile switching network by which we can program to connect the working devices? So if maybe multiple lasers, multiple modulator, and we connect only the functioning one using a non-volatile uh, programmable photonic platform. That's kind of what we are doing with this phase change material. So this material under, undergoes a non-volatile phase transition. So when you change the phase, you change a very large amount of index, but you don't have to keep on applying uh, any external perturbation that you need, for example, for electro-optic effect or for thermo-optic effect. Uh, so another application we are interested in kind of looking into some sort of this optical information processing, but using free space optics, uh, so can we, uh, instead of using this, what is known as, you know, 4F uh, system, can we do like a single meta optics to extract certain features from the scene and then rely on a maybe computational backend. Now, this whole thing kind of uh, are very related to this uh, approach, this, uh, this project, the nanophotonic computational image sensors on which I'm going to spend most time today. And the idea is very simple, that we all this nanophotonic technology that we have, can we use them to create a small image sensor. And it turns out that when you make this image sensor small, your performance goes down. Nothing to do with actually whether you're using meta optics, whether you're using diffractive, it's just the fundamentally, uh, the space bandwidth product of this kind of imaging systems reduces as we make this computing system small and small. And the genetic idea is, can we use computation in the back end to get back some of this information? So that's kind of what uh, I'm primarily going to focus on today. So as we all know, the cameras are everywhere. Um, we all are carrying a camera in our pocket today, but for emerging applications, for example, autonomous navigation, of course, AR, VR systems, uh, even more advanced mobile photography, uh, smart home sensors, even like biomedical imaging system that requires new kind of cameras. And not just cameras, uh, many of these applications requires significant improvement on these two fields, this called computational imaging and computer vision. And these two field really belongs to the computer science community, not really in optics and physics, like it, we are kind of coming there, but most of the research is going on in the computer science and engineering department. And let me tell you how I think about the pipeline, uh, very simple abstract pipeline for computational imaging and computer vision. In computational imaging, uh, we actually use a low end optics. So basically maybe a single optics, sometimes you use even a disordered medium random surface to capture something. Uh, and the goal is that we want to reduce the volume of this imaging system, uh, that one of the goal. Um, and we capture something that doesn't look quite good, but then we turn on our computational um, block to get back a good image. So we are transferring all the burden from the optics to the software. In computer vision, it's a little bit different. We are actually using some high-end optics. And the goal here is to uh, uh, capture a very uh, good replica of the same. And then you put uh, turn on our computational block to get our feature extraction, pattern matching, and maybe make a decision, understand what the scene is, okay? This is a very kind of really abstract and very generic statement. But one of the things that is important to note that in these two fields, most of the work is happening in the computational domain, like coming up with new algorithms, running those algorithms faster. The optics is generally not designed. These optics are either kind of bought uh, from like commercial off the shelf, uh, sometimes they're using even a random uh, medium. And if you look into this computational algorithm, they are now by now largely been replaced by some sort of deep neural network. So all those things people used to use many different kinds of algorithms before, but right now almost everything where a deep neural network is, is working and they work fairly well. I and mean, there are of course several challenges, but one of the challenges that's very important is they require a lot of power. So even for inference and power and latency. So, the question that we are uh, we were asking for almost like nine years that can we reduce the computational complexity of this computing computing the deep neural network or any kind of computational block 
using free space optics. So what it means, so for example, let's say some four examples seen as I'm showing here, this is the objects we have. And our goal is to go to the right hand side. So either we want to capture an image that's exactly that good replica, like what we do with our cell phone, or maybe depth sensing, maybe identifying the cars, the objects on the scene, or maybe understand the whole scene. And can we use an engineered optics to bring it to an intermediate stage such that when you turn on our computational post-processing, that computational post-processing doesn't require as much latency as, as much power. We are not thinking about all optical. We are thinking about an optics that takes, takes you to an intermediate stage. The main difference is these optics are actually being designed, maybe in the pixel by pixel or maybe voxel by voxel level. And then we turn on our computational post-processing. And to do that, of course, we need to design the optics. Um, we need computational method. And then can we start co-optimize the optics with the computational algorithm? And that's really kind of what we, we are interested in understanding that is it possible to design this optics and computational algorithm together? And, and, and the idea here is that you take some of the um, problem from the computational block, with all this power and latency, and you transfer some of those uh, computational capability in the optics itself. But at the same time, uh, you are simplifying the optics using the computational building block. Now, these ideas are not necessarily new. Even back in 1989, Goodman have talked about this. And this 2008 paper, uh, David Stock really actually talked, discussed exactly that. The new imaging system, instead of trying to make a nice focus spot, can we actually think about the whole system together and see what is your final output and just optimize the system to get your final output? And I say that this also, you can simplify these optics using computing, which will be a very important uh, message in this today's talk because some of the work that I'm going to show you even like few, few months back people thought it is not possible but it is possible but as, uh, as I'm going to show you using computing and we are simplifying optics because just solely relying on optics will not get us there. Okay and in some way as I mentioned that there is some connection with the deep neural network. This is a fairly new way of thinking about deep neural network in my mind uh, in my opinion. Uh, if you think about current deep neural network uh, and a very abstract level, they are essentially um, uh, uh, layers of linear, non-linear, linear, non-linear non layers. The linear layers are either convolutional or fully connected layers, and the non-linear are ReLU or some kind of softmax like non-linearity. Now, is it possible to bring a lot of linear layers in front, implement them using optics, and this together actually acts as a significant um, uh, kind of dimensionality reduction blocks. So you have a large number of pixel image, but you can extract only a few features. And then you have a one handoff and it goes to software. I am not going to spend too much time on it, but there are a few reasons you want to still think about as a multiple layers of optics, both when you are training it, like even though anyone will say like, if you have a linear layer, many layer, you can always collapse it into one uh, matrix or one linear operation. But it actually turns out that you cannot really train them very well. So to train them efficiently, you still want to think about as multiple layers, both in terms of like the computational blocks, so maybe uh, like you still want to think the multiple convolution or multiple convolution and fully connected layer. And from the optics side also, it's not guaranteed that just because you have a matrix, you can make them with a single optic. So you still want to think about it in the multiple levels. But that's why it connects to this kind of optical information processing idea that can we implement a front end uh, using optics um, and that opt uh, that front end we will uh, of course computationally design and then co-optimize that co front end optical front end with the computational back. Now as I say this idea is not necessarily very new. So why this has not been done? And the, one of the reason is uh, the optics has been like fairly bulky, misalignment prone. Large this is an image of my uh, my lab. And um, one of the solution is this dielectric meta optics or dielectric meta surface. Now, many of you probably know what is dielectric meta optics, but let me just for the sake of completeness and tell you what I think about meta optics. Um, uh, let's start with a very basic, simple refractive optics. We all have learned about it in freshman physics. And the way this works, a lens bends light because light coming at different part of this uh, curvature undergoes that you see a different um, cur curvature and that's why they bend differently based on Snell's law. But with the Fourier optics, we can also start realizing that light incident at different part of this lens undergoes a different phase shift 
And as you have a different phase shift, anytime you go to two pi, you can make it to zero and you can get your first kind of kinoform diffractive optics. Now you can simplify this continuous uh, profile, which is difficult to fabricate using a quantized, maybe a one stage quantization or multiple stage quantization. And that's how you get a multi-level diffractive optics. And how it looks, if you think about a lens, there's a SAC profile of a spherical lens, when you do this kind of two pi, anytime you are reaching two pi, you're going to zero, this is how it's going to look like. Right? This kind of a final lens we all have uh, seen in somewhere, uh, but I wanted to make sure that we all are on the same page. It turns out that if you take this kind of diffractive optics and put it them in the sub wavelength length scale, uh, you get this what is known as meta optics. And, 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 and the, one of the benefit there is you can get this phase, the, the, the zero to two pi phase, you can change it just by changing the lateral geometry. So why is that? So if you think about a very simple two slab of material, light is traveling there, the phase shift that you get is given by this expression, like two pi n is the index of the material and then the length or like basically the depth by which light is traveling. Now, to get two phase shift, we need two different thickness. That's what we know. But when we derive this equation, we implicitly assume that the lateral extent of the slabs are larger than the optical wavelength. So let's think about one yeah. application. Uh, is there a question? Okay. No. Okay. No. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So um, the, you have three scatterers. They're all sub wavelength, but of different size, and light is incident on them. Now, light, even though you're drawing like a ray, it's not really like a point. It has a lateral extent, which is on the order of wavelength. So this three scatterer light is going to see slightly differently. And one way to think about it, that it's going to do a special averaging of the index between N, the medium by which the scatterer is made of, and the surrounding medium of in its air. So you can get an effective index. Now, this is a fairly qualitative statement. To understand this, you really need to do like rigorous uh, full wave simulation, but that's why you can actually get different phase shift when you go to the sub wavelength length scale, keeping the same thickness. And that essentially means we can make them with a single stage lithography, which significantly reduces the complexity of manufacturing. The second one, uh, we know that any kind of diffractive optics will have higher order diffraction. And we know from that very simple grating, if the, this, this capital lambda is the period, period of the grating, um, the first order diffraction happen when this, this lambda sine theta is equal to like small lambda or wavelength. And as you can see that if the periodicity is less than lambda, then sine theta becomes greater than one. That essentially means when you have a sub wavelength structure, you don't have higher order diffraction. You can guide all the light to the zero order diffraction. So these two aspects make the meta optics uh, different from conventional diffractive optics. But in my opinion, meta optics is just a new, not like a, an extreme form of diffractive optics with sub wavelength periodicity. And that brings a very important question that I think we should always ask ourselves. That is meta optics is the old wine in a new bottle? And a lot of people are asking this. I mean, we, okay, we kind of knew about those things. And I think it's it, in some way it's true, but there are three things that I feel is really new. One of them is computation. We actually have a lot of computational techniques at hand, uh, at hand today that we can start designing those optics pixel by pixel. More importantly, today, almost every camera or a bulk of camera comes with a computer with it, right? be it your cell phone, be it your uh, laptop. And that really allows you to now start thinking about optics as not just as an image capturing device, but more like an image capturing plus computing device, which was not the case even like 30, 40 years back. Second is nanofabrication. We actually can fabricate many of these devices today in the visible uh, using, of course, uh, lithography system, but I mean, like, I remember like my, my advisor, uh, she told me like when she was in Caltech back in 2000, she, the Caltech was only one university which has an EDM lithography. Now, almost every university in the United States have an electron beam lithography machine. People are doing a lot of additive manufacturing, nano imprint. So that's another thing. And finally, the applications. Often like some of this field is driven by uh, what kind of applications are there. And some of this application we are talking about today, like autonomous navigation, smart home, augmented reality, they were, I mean, they were always there, but it was not as popular as it is today. So this kind of what makes meta optics a very interesting field to study, in my opinion, even though the physics of it may be like very well known and not necessarily new. Okay, so how do you design meta surface? So we have many different ways, but just let's think about the simplest forward design. Uh, so you can, we start with a periodic structure. 
And in the periodic structure, by changing um, the, in this case, you keep the same uh, pitch and you change the thickness. And then in, for a same pitch and same thickness, we change uh, the diameter. And we, we run actually this kind of rigorous coupled wave analysis to figure out, okay, what is the amplitude and the phase response of those this, this kind of grading structure. And once we identify something that is gives you kind of uh, uniformly uh, high uh, transmission, depending on what your application is, we are talking about lenses here. So you want like almost unity amplitude and the phase is going between zero to two pi. Then you also identify a phase distribution and then you discretize the phase in X, Y plane. And then for each X, Y plane, you know the Z height that can give you the phase. And for that phase, you find the scatterer parameter and that's how you make your meta optics. So this is an image showing that as you can see, there is an underlying square periodicity and the scatterer size is changing and each scatterer size gives you a different phase. Um, and, and, and this one of the things that's very important in meta optics that uh, you, you don't need to make rotationally symmetric device. You can make any kind of um, form factor that you want uh, just because you, you are just going to use a new mask and make lithography. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, that I believe that when you start thinking about computation and meta optics together, and we also call it software defined optics because like the software defined radio, you are not relying purely on the radio, you actually have a software block. Many of these applications can be looked into, but I have been very interested for almost six, seven years to think about, can we actually capture a good image? And the, my reason is very simple. Uh, we, we know that lens is very good at taking image, almost most of the applications of lens you can think about today are for imaging. Can we actually at least do that using meta optics before we start thinking about replacing refractive or maybe even work with refractive? So that's kind of what we have been interested in. And it turns out that meta optics or in general, any refractive optics has very strong chromatic aberration. Uh, this is an actual chromatic aberration, light at different wavelength focuses at different part uh, along the optical axis. This is an experimental result. You can see red, green, and blue is focused at different distance from the lens along the optical axis. And it essentially means if you put a sensor, let's say here, green will be well focused, red and blue will be defocused. And then essentially, if you want to capture this tulip fill, this is how your image is going to look like. Now, why that chromatic aberration ha happens? Um, it, it turns out for many reasons, many people who are working in meta optics and not in meta optics, they think that really it's coming from the sub wavelength nature of the meta optics. It actually has very little to do with that. This really comes from the fact that the phase wrapping that happens when you're going from two pi to zero, that point is reached for different wavelength at different radius for the lens. So it is a really a global properties of the meta optics or any diffractive optics. This is nothing actually any bad about meta optics that gives you more chromatic aberration. Any diffractive optics will have a very similar chromatic aberration. But this global properties of the meta optics really gives you this kind of chromatic aberration, which is very well uh, described in, uh, in paper by Andre. Uh, and we also wrote it in the review paper. And again, this is known from a long time back. Uh, what um, uh, Francesco from Cornell recently uh, wrote a nice paper, really kind of putting this all these things together as a time bandwidth product and showed that there is really a fundamental limitations of getting large aperture or large numerical aperture meta optics uh, of, of working on a broadband uh, regime. Um, there are two work that tried to solve this using this, what is known as dispersion engineering. They actually showed that you, they can make lenses that focus uh, out over the whole visible wavelength uh, they are have limited aperture and numerical aperture. And they actually talked about the fundamental limits in their work. Francisco really put them in all in the kind of, you know, one equation showing that this is really a fundamental limit. Um, and um, this is came out in Nature Photonics by Federico, who is like a pioneer in this field. Um, it, this is in December, 2022. And essentially he said that the large aperture achromatic meta optics cannot be built. Okay. And I'm going to show you today that um, Federico is right that you cannot make a large aperture acromatic meta optics, but you don't need an acromatic meta optics to capture full color imaging. Okay, so I'm going to tell you somewhat more like chronological order, like how we solve this problem over the last six seven years that we actually can get a very high quality image uh, with a fairly large model, like thirty degree field of view using an one centimeter meta optics while preserving all the color. 
And I think the main thing that I'm going to uh, discuss today is that we actually also know the design rules of how to start make, thinking about this meta optics when you're going for the broadband operation. Okay, so the idea that we started with is if you look into current meta optics, they focus at different planes. So green is focused here, red is focused here, blue is focused here. Is it possible to make the fo meta optics focus along a line? So instead of a point or a very long line, the light will be focused for green, red, and blue. And it turns out that this is well known as extended depth of focus optics. So you are extending the depth of focus. We are not making an achromatic optic. So each, the, the centroid of the, this extended depth of focus is going to change with the wavelength. But if you extend them enough, we can make sure that all the light comes in the same way to the sensor. And if we know what it is doing, we, we hoped that we can use a post-processing software to get back the image. So that's how we started. Now, I, I think I mentioned in the beginning that my background is quantum optics. When we started thinking about this problem, we did not know much about computational imaging. So we did some, read some paper and we went to like really computational imaging 101 to look into a front coding. And it turns out this is a very famous uh, work, cubic face mask from Ed Dowski. And I arguably that really that work started the field of computational imaging. He showed that if you add a cubic phase mask with a lens, you get a range of uniform points that function. So what it means that in the focal plane of a traditional lens, you get a very nice focus. You go away from the focal plane, you get a blurrier image. With the wavefront coding or adding this cubic mask essentially give you something that doesn't look like focus at all, but they remain same between the focus and defocus plane. And if you're doing optics for a long time, you'll probably recognize it right away that this is essentially you are creating an ARA beam, which is a diffraction that doesn't change with the diffraction, right? So that's what we are kind of trying to do, that the beam remains kind of same along the line, okay? Um, and this, of course, people actually have looked into this in experiment. And um, in, in this case, uh, people also have used that to solve some of the chromatic aberration in the refractive, but no one has done that for diffractive and meta optics. So first we realized we don't need two elements. We can just combine these two in a single phase mask. And that's kind of what we did. So this is the phase mask we implemented. This is almost like eight, uh, six years back. Um, this is my lens and this is my cubic element. When alpha is equal to zero, you get a Fresnel lens, uh, as I showed before. As your alpha becomes non-zero, you start seeing this asymmetry, but this asymmetry is the key to create that extended depth of focus. So how does the experiment look like? Um, first, um, if you have alpha equal to zero, that's the hyperboloid meta lens. Green is very well focused, but red and blue gets blurry. So you just put the sensor, this is experimental result. We are using three LED. So green is well focused, red and blue is in the same plane, uh, defocused. But this is what we see with our cubic meta surface. So we see things that has essentially, they look very similar. And we are just showing three angle, but you can probably convince yourself, we can also run that with the simulation because at that time we had only three LEDs, that these are also actually same within that wavelength. So it's very important to, to make sure that the, all the PSFs are same what the whole wavelength range. And the reason is when you are imaging in the ambient light, you have all the color and your color um, um, filters that you're using in the camera, these are broadband. They are actually getting wavelength from various different things. It's not just RGB. Okay, so then I also mentioned briefly that we hoped that we can get back the information. And it's a very important point because often people ask us, ask me that can we not solve the chromatic aberration of meta lens, like the hyperbolic meta lens using uh, computing? And the answer is no. And let me tell you why. Uh, if you take a Fourier transform of those things, what this, this is essentially called point spread function, you do Fourier transform, you get the modulation transfer function. And what modulation transfer function tells you that your, your, your scene has some special information, but that essentially means it also has some momentum information or case space information. So that spatial frequency, this modulation transfer function tells you what gets multiplied to that spatial frequency uh, when it goes through that optics. So you can see in the meta lens, green is very nice, but blue and red is fairly narrow. It has a lot of zeros. Zeros are bad. When you multiply something by zero, that essentially means you are not capturing that information. And if you don't capture that information, computation is not magic. It cannot get back, give, give you back that information that you all did not capture. 
In our case, we actually take a fairly large hit in the low frequency component, but our zero crossing happen in a much larger distance. So we have those information at least captured. If we know how we captured it, or essentially what is that modulation transfer function, we can get back the information. Okay, and uh, essentially then what it means that you, you can then run um, a, a winner to convolution. This is again, 101 um, computational imaging or Fourier optics. And with that, um, we hoped, again, these are some of the things that I'm going to justify more because when we did, did this, we did not know, but our hope was that as we do computation, this MTF is going to increase because at the end of the day, you can think about that what is the effective MTF and that MTF should be as close to diffraction limited as possible. So that was our um, hypothesis that we, with this Wiener deconvolution, we are going to increase the MTF. And uh, so we went ahead and did the experiment um, to, uh, with a 200 micron aperture with F number of one. And this is what it looks like. So let's just focus on this. This is my ground truth. As you capture the uh, singlet, you can see your sky color is kind of gone. Your all the stems are kind of blurry, but we get back the sky color and the stems using our, our extended depth of focus meta optics and filter. So we, we solved the chromatic aberration to some extent. This is back in 2018. Um, from that time, we essentially are looking into, can we actually make a large area meta surface? And this was 200 micron to designing this large area required a few things, which I'm just going to kind of briefly mention. One is instead of a cubic, we started making rotational symmetric extended depth of focus meta lens. So we can just exploit the symmetry and optimize only along the radius without optimizing the whole area. And we use Hankel transform to do that. And secondly, instead of uh, like trying to figure out how the field is propagating, we just go to the only the a sensor plane and optimize the point fit function exactly there. So the, we, re we rethought the figure of Meri to design up to one centimeter meta optics. And this is what it looks like. So we now have a one centimeter F by F2, uh, uh, extended depth of focus meta optics, which uh, we can have a 3D printed mount to can put it um, with, with the kind of the Thor Labs C mount and S mount. And we can put directly on the camera, no other optics that being used. We can directly put it on, on, on the sensor. Uh, and this is what the image looked like. So this is our uh, ground truth um, and it's a static imaging. And this is what it looks like after Wiener deconvolution. Uh, we can actually also do like some sort of video capture. This is inside my student office. Um, clearly the image quality is not there, but if you know these people, you actually will uh, recognize them. And in general, you can probably see that uh, you, you can get some information like how many people are there, maybe maybe their gender and a few other things that you, you can probably look into just by looking at those images. Right? So this is kind of one of the first uh, video image that I think people have taken. This is a real time video image taken with this extended depth of focus uh, meta optics. Okay, but the thing is that the image quality is still really not there. And this is something that uh, that remains a big problem um, in, in the meta optics community. So this is the work that all these th three work came out in 2018. Uh, this is from Federico's group, this is DP size group, this is from my group. And we all this work kind of showed that we are solving some sort of chromatic aberration better than meta op like simple hyperbolic meta lens, but these are not very good image. So how can we solve that? So to do that, we actually collaborated with uh, uh, Professor Felix Heide from Princeton. And we did this, what is known as end-to-end -end approach. And end-to-end -end approach essentially telling us that Instead of trying to make a good lens, we are and as I mentioned before, we want to directly optimize our final result, and that final result in this case is uh, is image quality. So we implemented uh, in a whole whole thing is done in an automatic differentiation pipeline. So we have an automatic differentiation routine for modeling the meta optics, and then we get the image, the ground truth, and then we computationally uh, deconvolve. Uh, the, Computer deconvolve it, and then we try to minimum make sure that the captured image is same as the ground truth, and that is structural similarity. And PSNR became our figure of merit to optimize that. To do that, of course, you need to make sure there is an easy way to model the meta optics. So we created some proxy meta surface model. In this particular mo uh, work, we use a polynomial fitting, uh, making sure that given the structural parameters, lambda and angle of incidence, we can figure out what is the phase that the scatterer is giving us. Now we actually have a deep learning based model uh, that really allows us to go into a little bit more complicated uh, scatterer, which I'm going to briefly mention at the end of the 
um, presentation. Okay, now how this EDOF thing comes here. So as I say, like the EDOF was our first initial idea that okay, we can make extended depth of focus, but how that boils down here. So the, the, the insight was that we want all our color and all our angle to come in the same way uh, to the sensor and to implement that. And this is kind of some of these nitty gritty details, which is not maybe written very well in the paper, but this one of the things that really, really worked is um, when we use the meta optics to model the image capture, we use the PSA for different angle, different wavelength to make sure that we are modeling the meta surface as well as possible. But then when you deconvolve it, we actually use just the center wavelength and the center uh, like normal incident PSF for deconvolution. So we are not actually using different PSF for the deconvolution and that helped us to kind of make sure that all these PSF kind of trying to be similar because we ultimately, we are trying to maximize the image property, okay? Uh, so this, there was this trick that we played and that really gave us a significant improvement as you can see here, that this is the first time I think we started capturing some images which are not like very simple images, it's actually fairly complex image. Uh, this is taken with a compound optics with six element, and this is the end-to-end -end design meta optics. This one was a 500 micron aperture, F2, and field of view of like 40 degree, and latency is around 36 milliseconds. So this is what kind of we, we got. Now, when, when we got this result, um, I, given the fact that I'm not actually a computer scientist, I'm more coming from a physics and optics background, I always ask myself that how much role the computing is playing. And we did not know at that time how to answer that. So one of the things that we at least tried that, okay, uh, we, we designed all those things. Ultimately we have an optics, but instead of using this kind of complicated computational backend, which we call feature propagator, it involves a neural network, which uh, I, I don't really have time to go over. Uh, can we use other like simple computational backend like Wiener and this kind of alternative direction method of multipliers? And what we found is they actually give still much better image than what we could do with the cubic or any other element. So that gave us a first hint that this design method actually giving us a new kind of optics. It's not computation only. We are actually coming up with a new optics, okay? So we wanted to understand what that optics is actually doing. So this is our like latest result, which is still unpublished. Um, so now we have this with a one centimeter meta lens, as you can see here, this is a one centimeter optics, which you put it on the camera. And this is what we are seeing. This is my displayed image, right? This is, uh, we are actually capturing the refractive now. And with the one centimeter aperture F2, we can actually buy an, 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 an optics from Edmund Optics and we can compare side by side the performance of a refractive and a meta optics. And there are two versions of meta optics. One is just extended depth of focus and one is an end-to-end -end design. Now you can see that things are, of, things are getting kind of similar looking, but what is very important to recognize here that if you look into the refractive one, at large field angle, your leaf is starting looking blurrier, but we actually don't have that much blurry, blurry in, in using meta optics. So not only we are getting comparable performance of a single refractive, it's not multiple refractive that we have in your cell phone. We are also actually outperforming refractive in the large field angle. So why is that? And this, all those things, the computational method is very simple winner deconvolution, which you can run in real time uh, and you kind of understand okay, what it is doing. It's not a neural network, it's a generalizable uh, technique. So to understand that, we went ahead and started measuring the point spread function of this optics. I'm going to focus on mainly two. One is the refractive and one is our end-to-end -end broadband design. As you can see here in the refractive, the light is fairly well focused. And sometimes the spot is so small, you probably can't even see in the screen, but essentially it's a very, very small, nice tight spot focus uh, over all the wavelength range because chromatic aberration is very, very small in, meta uh, in refractive compared to meta optics. But as you go to the larger angle, you are start going to see this kind of uh, big point spread function. But our end-to-end -end design actually contents the, all the PSA for all the angle and all the wavelength in a much, much smaller volume. So that was our first thing we realized. And this is done without any computation. This is just the meta optics and the broadband. We are just measuring the PSF. Now we actually have a Fianium. We have an automated setup so we can change the wavelength and we can measure over, like we measure over much many, many more wavelength range. I'm just showing you like around, around 10. Uh, so we, we do have, much tighter point spread function compared to what you can do with, with, with the refractive. 
Okay, so then we also looked into the cutoff frequency of the NTF and the cutoff frequency is like the zero crossing point. And in general, the zero crossing doesn't have much meaning. It depends on the noise of the system. We kind of arbitrarily chose 1% um, that use that zero crossing um, line pair per millimeter. As you can see in the refractive, the zero crossing value is actually fairly low uh, line pair per millimeter for large angle. For our case with the end-to-end -end broadband, the zero crossing happen actually all of them in higher or average value is higher than what a refractive can do. Very importantly, of course, in the large field angle, we actually get a larger line square per millimeter where you are getting zero crossing with the end to end broadband compared to a refractive. And that's why in the large field angle, you actually get better performance using our uh, meta optics. So what role does computation play? I started saying that we, we hoped that computation is improving it. But it turns out there is almost no good way of measuring that what is the effective MTF after deconvolution, okay? So what we did, we went to like very, very simple, basic idea that we took the US Air Force because US Air Force, we have this line spare per millimeter and we can measure it. And from the measurement, we can get the contrast and we can create our overall MTF. So we basically figure out these different line features. We know the line spare per millimeter. And then we have the captured image and the deconvolved image. So this is how we did it. And uh, of course, this is how the contrast looks like. From the contrast using this thing, we can actually experimentally figure out that how um, the MTF is changing for different lines per millimeter. And I would like to point out there are a few other methods that people have tried, at least in the computational imaging community. We could not get um, results that actually match with our experiment because we know that the refractive is working better in some cases, but we, we could not uh, validate. But this way, I think this is exactly the straightforward way of measuring uh, the MTF and um, this, this works uh, fairly well. So what we found is very interesting. So this is the raw MTF before deconvolution. So refractive is very good, as you can see here. This is different wavelength, x-axis. This is the contrast in different lines per millimeter. The red or yellow values are higher and the black is lower value. So uh, the, the refractive is really good. Um, what happens in the hyperboloid, you have a kind of very sharp line, but it's only in one wavelength. Now, EDOF and end-to-end, -end, again, I'm not sure whether it's very visible in the, in, the, in the presentation, but if you look closely, you will see that all the values are lower, but they are not zero. They are actually, they have some values that we preserved. Then we do MTF after deconvolution. So after deconvolution, using this AR4 method, we can get the MTF. And what we found is you get some improvement in the refractive, not that much, but the EDOF and end-to-end -end actually give you largest improvement. And that's what we, we get does the improvement due to computation. So our meta-optics not only preserves more information in the sensor, it actually also allows the computation to retrieve those information more than the other optics. And that's kind of really, I think the main story is here that we, our optics is um, designed such that we not only are capturing more information, we are making the computational block to actually even retrieve more information than what we can do with other uh, the extended depth of focus optics. Just wanted to kind of show you here in the broadband meta optics, after computation, we are essentially getting around 30% contrast at 125 lines per per millimeter, which is kind of one of the numbers that we, we found is for, for example, and this is all for normal incidents. Um, we, um, it, it of course drops off a little bit when you go to that larger uh, angle, but this is kind of the 125 lines per millimeter, 30% is one of the numbers we got for like commercial camera that you need to hit. Uh, so, it, so that's kind of what we are getting um, here then um, using our, our end to end design. What happens when you do like a little bit more complicated backend? So there's a neural network based backend. This is actually taken with a cell phone camera, so multiple lenses. And this is with the meta optics and the neural network backend. And this is the image quality you can get. And this is with the winner deconvolution. Now, uh, so with the diffusion uh, neural network based deconvolution, we are actually getting comparable image with the multiple lenses. But I like to point out here that some of the finer features are missing in this image. Uh, and it also doesn't really run in real time. So it's probably not very useful for video capture, but the winner still preserves most of the information and it's probably kind of, uh, like, and these are taken with the ambient light. Previous ones were with the OLED disc, these are with the ambient light source, but it, it, it's, it's acceptable quality and it's significantly better than what we could do with other uh, lenses. 
this is a video capture again um uh, this is the winner because all the video capture that i'm showing it can be done only with the winner neural network cannot do video capture so you can see here you are preserving all the color information you can see red yellow green with this meta lens and this taken with this one one centimeter meta optics um, um again um, the image quality is actually better than EDOF, uh, which we also quantitatively demonstrated. Um, so what actually happens in, in this end-to-end -end design, right? I told you like a little bit about like the final kind of what is that, that our MTF is better. And if you look into it, and you can see that also in the visible meta optics, but if you do it in the thermal, you can just see it just in your naked eye and you can see this thing. This is an hyperboloid meta lens. This is the end-to-end -end meta optics. You actually solve for a lot of higher order aberration by putting a lot more extra term in uh, near the circumference. This is actually rotationally symmetric. It just looks like that way due to the, some optical illusion. But you, you're uh, near the circumference of the lens, you actually have a lot of higher order terms. Okay, and in we are actually also having a startup. We're trying to commercialize some of this technology. So previous result that I showed you, that's a single aperture. We get 30 degree field of view. Uh, with the in, in in the tune optics, we can get around 55 degree uh, diagonal uh, field of view, but it also requires multiple aperture. But uh, essentially, we we have a, only one millimeter total track length, fairly uh, thin camera, and we we preserve the image quality as you can see between the ground truth and this is the processed image. Okay, so finally, in the last few minutes, let me tell you a little bit about what we want to do with this, like all this knowledge that we gain, right? Um, so the first thing that we realized that we would like to get uh, some uh, design uh, insight. Um, yeah, so the normalized, um, the design insight, the first one design insight is each wavelength needs to have the modulation transfer function um, that's an identical. That's one of the design insight we, we realized. The second is the first zero has to be at the larger uh, spatial frequency. And finally, we still want to improve um, uh, the volume under the NTF curve. And with these uh, approaches, we actually now have developed a new uh, uh, inverse design uh, technique, which doesn't involve computing. We're actually now going back to just designing the optics, knowing that what kind of optics we need to be able to get more information out using the computational backend. This we call MTF engineered. Uh, approach. This code is actually publicly available. Uh, if you are interested, I'll be happy to send you the Git code so you can actually install and start working on it. So we start with um, RCWA, we get this um, phase and then you do angular spectrum. And then we go to the stale ratio. Uh, we create like this, we define the stale ratio is the area under uh, the MTF curve divided by the or volume under the MTF curve where the volume under the diffraction limited MTF curve. Uh, so that way we actually design the optics without exactly relying on the computation. And that sometimes can be helpful because your computational complexity of designing optics go down. So one of the things that we recently did with that is in the thermal imaging range. So in this case, you can see that we actually have complex scatterer and the simple scatterer. So we, in, in our pipeline, we can first recognize what kind of uh, scatterer family you want to use. We use the deep learning to map the scatterer to phase. So this is the complex scatter that is for the simple scatterer. And this is what uh, the fabricated structure looks like. So we can actually get even like almost close to four inch meta optics using this kind of, um, uh, in, in the thermal range using laser writing. Uh, so we are now actually looking into making even bigger, like maybe 10, uh, 12 inch meta optics, uh, but all in the thermal visible, it will be very hard to do. Um, so this is some of the experimental result. Uh, so in the broadband, as you can see here, uh, if you if you capture with the meta optics, like a hyperboloid meta lens, you, you get something in, in the broadband illumination, but if when you put a filter at 10 or 12 micron, you actually see a significant reduction. And the reason is reduction in quality. The reason is that 10 micron, it might be well focused, but at 12 micron, the focus has shifted. When you do the broadband, you actually kind of, the meta optics itself kind of acts as a color filter so you still get something that may be legible. But with our approach, the complex scatterer and MTF engineer, we get significantly better image and they actually preserve both with the filters, which is not the case when you have a meta lens. And then we can go to imaging in the broad, in ambient radiation in the real wall. So this is taken with a refractive that comes with the flower. And the, all this work is taken with a boson uh, uncooled camera. 
If you do a hyperboloid meta lens, this is what it looks like. This is essentially a very strong chromatic aberration. And this is what the MTF engineered one looks like. Now, this also brings one of the limitations of this computational imaging. So if you look into the difference of quality between a refractive uh, and a meta optics, for visible, that difference is actually much smaller than the thermal range. And that's because in thermal range, you have a lot more noise in the this uncooled camera. So we did this experiment with a cool camera uh, for MWIR and the image quality is actually significantly better. Uh, so that's the uh, a price we pay when you go to computational imaging that if you have too much noise then you cannot get back those information that gets kind of lost. And you can think about it again, like the, the zero crossing is de determined by the signal to noise ratio that is acceptable in your system. Okay, so I kind of told you mostly about the um, full color imaging, but this kind of computational sensor we actually have used to do like very focal imaging. So we use a static meta optics, but using extended depth of focus property and computational backend, we can bring different scene at different um, depth uh, to focus. We did computational spectroscopy. We have done depth sensing. And very recently, which I am fairly excited about, like looking into kind of an optical encoder to get information out of the scene. And what we've shown here is uh, if you have an, an scene, in this case, we are also trying it with the MNIST data set. Now we are going to actually realistic data set. And if you take, if you capture all the pixels, a large number of pixels, and you pass it to the computational backend, very soon you don't have much benefit of using an optical fountain. Actually, com computation, just electronic backend gives you almost similar accuracy. But when you capture very little number of data, so for example, from like, like let's say you have an MNIST data that has 32 by 32 image, but you are capturing only nine points, you get an enhancement of 10% classification accuracy over pure electronics. Um, so there are a few things that we are kind of looking into. So in kind of coming in the kind of coming to the conclusion, so this is how our progress has been. This is used to be in 2020, and we have come here. And uh, I showed you that like really the aberration free, uh, it's a quote unquote, depending on how we mean, is, is possible, but we need computation. There are a few uh, problems that uh, we, we have, but that brings an important question that is this image quality good enough for our practical applications? And that's uh, something that uh, we, we are actually struggling to answer because this image quality, which is significantly better from where we started, is still not as good as the cell phone image quality. And one of the things that we are now moving towards that instead of using meta optics alone, can you use refractive plus meta optics? And these are very recent work that came out like a few months back. Uh, so we showed that using a hybrid refractive and meta optics, uh, this is a compound optics, um, several uh, lenses from a DSLR camera. This is the image quality we can get with a single refractive and meta optics and computation. So there are, we add, add one more refractive compared to what we are showing you. We actually can get a comparable quality. So we, we think that with the refractive and meta optics, we probably still can get to a point, maybe we can get to a cell phone like image quality. That's something remains to be seen. But a single meta optics, I think we kind of are reaching a limit, but it still like preserves all the color, but maybe the image quality is not really there for like uh, getting into a cell phone. Um, uh, quality. And finally, I think the synergy of the computation and meta optics, um, there are a lot of things that we are just really scratching the surface. Uh, and I think there are a lot of things needs to be done. And this, like, we, we are really just starting to think about what can be done with that. So with that, I'll stop and I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let me... Maybe just uh, and, uh, I will leave the I leave this slide just in case somebody he want to put some slide. Okay, so any questions from the audience? Yeah. I, I have a question. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, so th thank you for the talk. Um, really interesting. It was nice to see the trajectory and understand it. Um, so two questions. One is, um, have you measured scatter from these? And because uh, I know one of the things that was so difficult for diffractive optics back in the 90s uh, was the fact that um, it was really, really difficult to get scatter low enough for a high image quality. Have you 
Have you done any high dynamic range scatter measurements on these lenses? Um, so we have done, uh, I think our dynamic range is not very high and our scatterer, as I say, like, so the way I, I at least think about it, that the scatterer information is there in kind of the noise. So if you have a lot of scattering in the whole screen, uh, when you do this um, um, MTF measurement, you will see like a sharp peak and that really reduces that where your zero crossing is going to be. So that information is there. Uh, our dynamic range, I cannot give you an exact number on the dynamic range, uh, but we, we do we do see some scattering. But having said that, we we, we think that with the silicon nitride, uh, that's what we're using. Our index contrast is not that high. So yeah, I forgot to mention these all made of silicon nitride. Um, we, we, with improved fabrication, the scattering seems much lower than before. And those are they are, I mean, in, in the analysis, like, and, and the computation can help get rid of some of the scattering. So I said, like, if you just look into the image itself raw, that's uh, significantly worse. But if we know like what kind of scattering happens, we can get back those information using computing to some extent. And the, the second question, when you compared it to a refractive system, yes, uh, it looked like based on the off axis, behavior that the refractive system had a lot of fuel curvature. Yes. Was, was, was that a well-corrected system or? No, it, it's, oh. it's a single single refractive, right? As I oh, okay, so just yeah. a singlet? It, it's a single, single refractive. Okay, all right. Yeah. So yeah, this one. So as I say, when you go to eight lenses and you can't start correcting all those things, then we are not there with the single meta optics. But yes. I see uh, 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 Jim, Jim has raised a hand. Jim, do you want to go ahead? With you? Yes, uh, yeah, thank you um, for the, the, the talk. It was very interesing. One question I have, you, you mentioned uh, noise is, is an issue and you mentioned it's a cooled camera. Uh, what is the uh, number of bits that the uh, um, raw data is captured to? So all these things that are raw data is captured uh, for the visible at 12 bit and for the thermal it's a uh, 8-bit, I believe, but this is uncooled. It's not cooled. With the cooled, you get much better image. Yeah, uh, yeah, because uh, there, there was work done um, in the, uh, about five, 10 years ago that showed that the signal and noise of an 8-bit camera is effectively nine. And for wavefront coding, you needed uh, 28, um, cubic wavefront coding, you needed 28 to be able to preserve the, uh, the dynamic range. So the, the number of bits that you capture are really important in terms of, I'll call it the effective zero crossings of your MTF. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So this is like we are doing with the eight bit here. Um, um, yeah, this is just, a, uh, um, yeah, this is the boson flare camera. Uh, we are not using cubic, but I, I, I do agree that we will have some limitations in terms of dynamic range uh, with, with this meta optics. Uh, the, the other comment I'll just make is the uh, ISO 12233 standard, which is the digital, still digital imaging standard, provides a very good estimate of the MTF in a very simple uh, format so that you don't have to rely on uh, Air Force targets to get the uh, MTF. Yeah, I'll be good. It'll be good to know like a little bit more about it. Um, if you can send me an email, we are very interested in understanding how to get this thing done. So I, I don't yeah. know much about it. If you can. Maybe send me an email and we can discuss. Sure, I, I I put it in the chat, but I can yes. send an email as well. Yeah, if it will be very helpful for me to know because we don't know exactly how this. We have to re reinvent the wheel on for this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the audience here? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, what sort of methods uh, do you think need to be approached to increase the the, the field? Because a lot of what you showed was very, very good at, at on axis, but once you moved off, off axis, things got uh, more difficult, way, way more difficult because of the diffractive nature of this. Um, it's, it, it's the end to end. Uh, oh, can you use that to heavily weight this off field points? in like an image system when you want to have more field on it? Yeah, so the, we, we are looking into some of those things with the array camera. So, you know, my, I, I would say like basically maybe the way I, I 
I don't know where it came up, but I feel that meta optics may not be really a single meta optics, single aperture meta optics may not be good for uh, imaging is kind of, I think, what we are, I am getting at. That we did a lot of things, but I think we are reaching a saturation point and it's still not good enough for cell phone-like image quality. So the two approaches that I am looking into, one is different aperture. So you are basically make multiple aperture. For us, it's like essentially the same, like one lens, we just make it all together. Each aperture does something else. So it's like one of the things that we have done and I did not talk about it. I'll be very happy to send you that paper. It's an archive. Each aperture looks at a different field and then you computationally correct it. That way we get a much larger field of view. And second thing is adding refractive. I think single aperture uh, meta optics, which we worked for like last six years, we learned a lot about what is possible, what is not possible. We develop a lot of techniques, but this is as good as it gets. If you know an application where this is good enough, I am, I'll be very interested in knowing. I have not found it, uh, an application where people are willing to pay money uh, for this kind of image quality. Uh, but when you go to the array and uh, maybe refractive, I think we can get to like really maybe a cell phone like image quality is what. We have some initial results showing that that's possible with a very small TTL uh, that we can get. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, um, uh, Arka, there are a couple of um, questions on the chat. So maybe you can answer from the chat directly. You can do that. Yeah, so what software do you use to design our meta lens? We actually design most of our uh, meta lens using rigorous couple wave and finite difference time domain. And we have our own um, um, code for this MTF engineering, which if you send me an email, I'll be happy to send you the link. Okay. And uh, I think there are a few comments from David, uh, three bird resolution, Jim. Um, yeah, I got the paper. Thank you, Jim, for the paper. Uh, maximum using the metal lens approach. Um, I don't know that answer on top of, I mean, like, I don't know how you define the it in you here, but essentially we have 30 degree field of view, one centimeter aperture. That's what we have right now. And with array, we can get to 80 degree field of view with an effective aperture of uh, three millimeters right now there was a question a little bit uh on the chat from david uh hassan Athanor, i think but asked earlier do you want to ask david that question no i think it's more like a comment right I was just, okay. you know, uh, a paper that suggests the contrast based on a three bar target air force target uh yeah. can be uh, quite different than the actual ntf and then uh below that uh uh, Jim Mikulski um, basically found the actual reference. So if you're interested, it's there. Yeah, thank you. And I think the Duncan has some question. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Oops. You go ahead, Duncan. Yeah, go ahead. Am I being called on now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I can't tell because I'm not in the room. Um, so using traditional optical design tools, can we think of this in the same way as we think of diffractive optics, notwithstanding how to make it? I understand the manufacturing is fundamentally different, but in terms of you know integrating it into a standard lens design code, like Code Five or ZMAX or something like that, can we um, think of it the same way as we think about diffractive optics? The answer is no, and the reason is in the diffractive optics you have like a kind of closed form expression for the phase as the thickness, as far as I understand. That of ZMAX and like if you do the binary two. Uh, in ZMAX, you can do one angle, one wavelength, no problem. You can design it. But the, anytime you are going to a different angle and different wavelength, that phase that you are getting from the meta optics is actually not differentiable. So there is no closed form expression. So you either have to do a lookup table or somehow you need to kind of know that for different angle and different um, wavelength, what is that scattering response? So that part, as far as I know, you cannot do that with, with, with the ZMAX uh, for sure, because ZMAX we have used, I don't know about Code 5, but my understanding is uh, you can always do an approximation, uh, but exact calculation will not be doable. Whereas like the binary two, I think they assume that as you're doing a different wavelength, you know what is the, that phase is. You are doing a kind of a, more like a continuously how your phase is changing as a function of wavelength and function of theta. 
we cannot do that in mid optics because of like this, this due to this kind of scattering response you have a lot subway thing response you have a lot of like resonance so it changes significantly between different wavelength it's not just a one over lambda kind of dependence thank you there is a question here in the room go ahead uh, at least one question is like uh, just more mechanics like i know for like uh, for synopsis are soft which is like does actually like equation like a simulation for different surfaces play well with code five just so i think you can use them together there Yes, I know that Zmax also is trying to do something with the Lumerical, I think, because ANSYS bought them. So we got some some stuff from there. We mostly relied on our own code. Uh, as I'll be happy to send you that. Uh, it, it's in a public domain uh, right now. Yeah. And designing a hybrid system combining. With, yes. So I think the I at this point, I think that for imaging, we need to do the hybrid is my um, that's my personal opinion but i think that's what we are doing that it has to be refractive and meta optics a single meta optics probably can got wherever how much we can get out of it but maybe not more than that all right i think uh we have done i don't see any other but i see one hand here okay yeah uh thank you for your talk i just have a quick question so you mentioned on uh the example where you're using a, a neural net for the convolution, that you're using uh, the PSF for different angles of incidence for different field points, but then you're only using the on-axis single wavelength for the convolution. Can you comment on why that's the case and how that affects the final performance? So, okay, so the main insight that what I was going to get, like what you want is your PSF or MTF to be same for all angle, all wavelength. So the, the fundamentally what we are doing differently than imaging, like we are not trying to get diffraction limited performance. We are not trying to get a very tight spot for all of them. We are essentially trying to say like maximize the volume under the MTF curve. At the end of the day, that's what it turns out that we were doing, even though maybe we did not know. But one way to do that was that we are essentially trying to deconvolve with a single PSF. So that way to maximize the image quality, it helps us even though like all those things are coming in use a different PSF, but ultimately the image quality become maximized, maximized when all these PSF becomes similar in the forward design. And that way we do that by the deconvol during deconvolution, we are doing only one PSF. So we're trying to actually make all those PSF kind of same as the um, um, as the normal instance and mid wavelength. And I, I, one of the things that I, I kind of did not mention very well, and we are living in the age of chat GPT where people are saying, oh, we are going to replace uh, all the uh, human beings will be replaced by AI. And you know, like inverse design, people were saying we don't need any optical engineer anymore. We we'll just, machine is going to design optics. What we found over the years that finding that figure of merit that gives you that design, it requires a significant amount of domain expertise. So that experience and all those things really gives you that what is the right figure of merit to start with. And then of course we will work with AI to kind of get things like design, but figure of merit is a very, very non-trivial thing. And often like we kind of came up with this thing, kind of thinking more that what really works. It's, I don't have a, uh, I'll say it's an art to figure out how to find out the figure of merit. Um, and that's one of the things that worked for us. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I think uh, let's uh, thank Professor Majmud Abar one more time. Thank you. Hope to see you some time and some other time. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Lots.